Aloha, Transpac race fans. I'm Dobbs Davis from Seahorse Magazine, giving you a day six race analysis from the Trans-Pacific Yacht Race from LA to Honolulu. We're in the uh, 51st edition of this biennial race, first race in 1906. Uh, so it's uh, pretty cool to see this tradition remain alive and well in the annals of classic ocean, ocean racing. Uh, this is our YB tracker, and we open up uh, always with this this screen, this is what you uh, see when you launch this from the link on our Transpac website. Uh, so I'm going to just set it up here for our discussion today. Take uh, that team panel out. This gives you an overview of where the race course is. So the starts have all gone off. We can see uh, three groups. Yesterday starters over here, uh, Friday starters here, and Tuesday starters spread out over here. Uh, they started off at Point Furman in uh, L.A. at San Pedro, racing 2,225 miles to finish at Diamond Head on the uh, island of Oahu, just outside Waikiki, uh, down here in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, some features to note here, with the uh, windy, with the help of windy and the, and the forecast uh, models that they create and the clever graphics, we can see uh, this ridge of light air up here. Remember the the wind scale is down here at the bottom of the screen, uh, the blues uh, up through five, 0, 5, and 10 knots. Uh, greens vary from uh, 10 up to 20 knots, and as we get green into orange, uh, that's uh, 20 to 30 knots of wind. The direction of the wind is depicted by these clever moving arrows, so think of those as, uh, as wind vectors. Um, we will zoom in a little bit here, so that, that, that's the big picture in the race course. Um, maybe this is actually a good time to talk a little bit uh, about this big picture. Um, the high pressure that is, is centered up here, the North Pacific High, has generally clockwise winds that go around it. That's a feature in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, the, the shape of this uh, and the way this is described as a, uh, they're not exactly circular, they're sort of oblong. Um, they, uh, therefore, uh, one of these oblong in the south, southeast corner of this, we call this a, a, a ridge. So a, a lobe in this direction is called a ridge. And so when the boats cross that ridge, they'll go from um, northerly, uh, in this case, reaching conditions on this track, um, to being more broad reaching and running conditions. So there's, uh, Stan Honey has a great explanation of this, uh, this race course. It's a uh, it's uh, described, if you go to his website, honeynav.com, uh, you'll see some links there to uh, an exclamation, in, both in writing and in a Zoom presentation he gave uh, for us uh, in this year's race, describing these three phases of the race. So um, one, getting off the coast and into these synoptic breezes here. Then you cross the ridge and you get into the middle part of the race. He calls this slot car racing because you set up to remain in your lane, basically. Um, there's nowhere else to go because if you try to deviate from course headed toward Hawaii, provided you've got the right breeze, you're just sailing extra distance. Um, and then as the breeze shifts further uh, east and, you're, and the wind is pointing more or less toward uh, the finish line, you then have the option to jibe uh, and choose either jibe and play the last part of the race like a downwind leg on a buoy course. So... Um, those three distinct phases uh, uh, necessitate three different strategies. What's happening now uh, with these guys, and, and earlier with these guys, is they set, set themselves up in these um, slot car lanes uh, to where they're going to travel the middle part of the race on starboard jibe. They're going to be reaching and broad reaching, and there's really uh, uh, no, no reason to deviate from course unless something significantly changes with the weather. Uh, and having said that, that's a good segue over into looking at weather. How does Windy get this information? Where does all this come from? Uh, so I did a little research and uh, looked into some of the weather models that they're using. Uh, this is a, actually I'll go to the other one, the GFS model. Um, this is the uh, global forecast system that's done by NOAA and the National Weather Service. Uh, it, uh, it gives a mid-range forecast out several days um, to, uh, to help, uh, help navigators plan uh, for what's happening ahead in, in, in a bigger picture. Um, there's another model called NAM we'll look at in a moment. But what I wanted to show you all was this. This is about now. This is a midnight 
uh, universal time, Greenwich Mean Time, uh, which is uh, for tonight. This is Sunday the 18th, so this is uh, midnight on the 19th, Monday. Uh, and this, this shows more or less the picture of what the models are suggesting is out there. Uh, Windy is showing us uh, a construction of what the winds are doing out there. It's interesting because that ridge that we saw, that blue, um, uh, blue area here, is probably what we see, that elongated uh, ridge of low wind is a, kind of a, uh, a minor uh, high pressure center sitting there. Um, the race course, if you haven't already guessed, is over here from California, Southern California, and over here in Hawaii. So focus on this area of the North Pacific. Um, isobars are uh, more or less lined up nicely. Um, the uh, 1020 line is this line here. That's been a traditional uh, fence for navigators. Uh, I can remember when I did this race years ago, pre-digital era, uh, we had a barometer. We kept track of the, the barometric pressure and uh, made sure that, that if the uh, pressure started going up above 1020, we'd think about bearing off if we had the speed to do that or if we were far, far enough ahead jibing to get out of there because it was sort of uh, regarded as being a, a bit of a fence to where the isobars are going to start spreading out to whatever the <clears throat> the uh, high pressure will be in the north. Now, um, at 1032, that's pretty high pressure. Uh, sometimes these, these uh, highs are not quite that strong, um, but that's what's giving us great rake, race conditions because nice Nice isobar alignment, good isobar spacing for a strong breeze. And as we go forward in time, and this is done in six hour increments, we can see this remains more or less the same. This is pretty stable. Uh, you know, the high shape might uh, um, squeeze around a little bit. Uh, looking at this thing out here, this seems to be a persistent feature. But our racers are all uh, further south than that. And there's not a lot of danger uh, to be up close to rum line or the great circle route, shortest distance to Hawaii, uh, which means if you sail less distance, then you get there faster. So um, this is uh, setting up nicely. This is the uh, 20th and out here to the 21st, uh, maybe even a little uh, isobar compression here, meaning a little higher winds for those that are in the middle of the course and heading, heading the fastest boats will be uh, uh, up in here, you know, thinking about their final approach, but but nonetheless, over the next next several days, uh, according to this model, it it really looks nice. Um, you know, classic transpac conditions, as uh, Peter Eisler calls it. He's navigating now on Piwacket. Uh, that was a term he used yesterday. So, all the way up through the 22nd, um, no no real change. And for those that are slower, no real change either. So, um, uh, great race conditions. Now, the other model, this Nam model is a higher resolution uh, model that's also used uh, with Windy and, and any of these other uh, forecasting tools. Um, again, Hawaii here, Southern California here. Uh, now here it shows a 1020 line being a little further south uh, than in the GFS, but what's really uh, more important is just the fact that the isobar spacing seems uh, pretty stable. This is uh, 0900 UTC tomorrow, and as you can see, as we progress forward in three-hour increments, uh, it still remains pretty stable. A little rotation maybe of the ridge, and and this is uh, actually a nice pronounced <clears throat> pronounced feature. This ridge line. So um, uh, as you're going from here to here, you know, hard reaching, lots of breeze, cross over the ridge, and then it becomes uh, broad reaching and running. So initial phase, the slot car phase in the middle of the race, and then the running phase into the finish. Uh, and even with the NAM model that's really uh, intended to be fairly short term, about three days or so in, in duration, um, this is still looking quite stable. In fact, this one suggests even a little more wind looking at those isobars. Uh, so that's uh, a little, little bit on, oops, went to the wrong page. Um, that, that's what that looks like. Uh, so when, when you use this tool here in Windy to look into the future, uh, the redrawing that it's doing is based on the projection uh, from those forecasts. There's another, another model that is commonly used uh, called the Union model. Um, 
I'm sure the guys at Windy use that. Uh, that is a paid for model. So the, the teams on the course are actually not allowed to download grip files from that one because you need a paid subscription. The, uh, the, the rules in this race uh, are that uh, you use grip files, meaning going out and grabbing those forecast models in digital form uh, and using them in your routing programs, but they have to be freely available. So uh, GFS and NAM are that, uh, the Euro model is not. But my guess is given the stability of the systems out here, uh, I bet there's probably pretty good alignment between the Euro model and, um, uh, and GFS. In, in broad terms, um, you know, maybe, uh, uh, maybe those that are really looking closely at the details would tell you otherwise, but, but that's what the teams are allowed to use in the race uh, for this cycle. So let's uh, zoom in a little bit and see in a little more detail uh, what's going on with our teams. Um, and let's see, this, uh, here we are, Cecil and uh, Allison Rossi's FAR 57, Pookolohe, I think I got that right finally. Um, they, uh, they're actually getting close to the halfway point, uh, so they're making great progress in the course. As you can see by their trails, if you look at the tails, um, here. Um, they've uh, had to come up a little bit. Maybe that's wind shift. Uh, maybe that's in their sail plan in order to be in a high speed uh, reaching mode. I look at this kink here in the track for these guys, uh, Nadi Boo. This is uh, Beneteau 49. It could be that, you know, this represents uh, them getting lifted out of a reaching mode into more of a broad reaching mode and putting up, uh, it's possible they might have up their their A3 spinnaker or, or a larger reaching sail. Um, so uh, so sometimes these these kinks in the course represent that. Um, so we'll keep, keep our eye on this group. Uh, these guys, where are they? Oh, here we are. Nalu 5. Nalu 5 is a great team. Uh, the only Cal 40 in the course this year. Classic, classic transpac boat. Oops. Under our screen. There we are. Uh, they... Um, they uh, are sending out uh, a daily uh, info letter, um, and I think our social media uh, manager, uh, Kate Summers, will be putting some content out from them. Uh, they're, they're telling stories. One, one that struck me today was the fact that they have ice cream on board, so I, I think that's great. I think they're saving it for a milestone occasion like the halfway point, so I hope, it, hope they're able to make that. Uh, leading the group, the second starting group on Friday, again, is Brett Walda. Uh, 11.2 knots, Bob Pethick and his team, uh, they, I think they're in their fourth trans pack on this boat and, uh, they, they've always been strong, uh, particularly in this phase of the race. This, this is an all carbon race boat. Um, and in their class, they've, uh, um, or sorry, in their, in their group or in their, uh, uh, that, that generalized group, there are a bunch of Santa Cruz fifties and Santa Cruz twos and, and a variety of race boats and, and fast cruiser racers. Uh, so they remain fairly tightly grouped and more or less on the same track. Uh, so again, that sort of indicates uh, high-speed, stable sailing. Um, and then let's zoom in a little bit here for the last group. Oh, I wanted to point out too here um, on in Friday's group, uh, the the tail end Charlie and this is or the guys on Live Wire Olson Forty. Now, why they're sailing up this high, I'm not sure. It could be because they don't have uh, any of these specialty reaching sails, and they're just on a on an upwind jib, um, and they're waiting to get to the point where they can bear off uh, enough to uh, set uh, possibly a, um, a flat spinnaker, an A3, or some something like that. Um, but uh, but nonetheless, I applaud these guys. About this time, I believe it was last uh, cycle two years ago that they broke their spar <laughs> and uh, and had to uh, go back a fair distance uh, back to the uh, mainland with uh, jury rig. So uh, just just getting this far and getting to Hawaii will be a great accomplishment for that team. Um, all right, starters yesterday. Uh, this is kind of amazing when you look at this. Uh, they we're going to actually go back a bit and just show you. The, uh, the advantages that come with speed. Um, one of the goals in getting off the California coast is getting away from the, uh, the land and getting away from the possibility of the breeze going light at night or being caught in a Catalina eddy. Uh, as you remember, Catalina eddies are the low pressure, local low pressure that sets up here 
in the in the California Bight that's uh, created in part by the high high northerly winds coming down the coast and at Point Conception the coast diverges away that uh, that sets up a, a counter circulation of breeze uh, called the Catalina Eddy um, and uh, if you if you get caught in that like the first starters did it, it makes for a slow first day these guys uh, their goal was to get out and away while there was still sunshine and a good thermal breeze. Yesterday they started off in 10 to 12 knots of wind and it got steadily breezier as they got out toward Catalina. Uh, one tack and one tack again and they're all off and running. Um, so usually the, the, the demarcation point is right out here in the westernmost of these uh, borderland islands. This one's uh, San Nicolas. So if you get out to San Nicolas before, before dark, you're usually in good shape. And that's precisely what happened uh, at that point in time. That's uh, 5.30 Hawaii time, which is 8.30 Pacific time. And uh, everybody has a nice, strong, straight track out of there. There's no, uh, no slowing down. So this group got quite lucky in getting out fast. Um, and uh, and that'll, that'll probably mean they'll, they'll uh, do well in overall standing. It's, it's been a few years since that's happened because uh, some of the other start groups have had better luck. Two years ago, uh, this group had a terrible time getting off, um, and, it, and uh, in fact, it probably deprived the Comanche guys of a course record simply because they hit this roadblock uh, in the eddy on the first day of the race. This group is not going to suffer that. Off they go, going fast. Um, Piwak is out there going over 18 knots uh, and, and straight line. Now, why are they not setting up up here in the shortest distance? Again, um, Navigator Peter Eisler is, is running the models and is doing the math, and uh, believe me, they're, they're choosing the straightest path possible. Uh, I don't think there's any, uh, I don't think Comanche's record's in danger. Um, this is a 70-foot boat, after all, not a 100-foot boat. Um, but, uh, but they could have quite a fast passage. Uh, Peter was telling me yesterday that uh, <laughs> about a week ago when they were looking at models, some of them had strong enough breeze to suggest they might be tapping on the uh, five-day, one-hour uh, course record that Comanche set in uh, 2017. But uh, you know now the models have shifted a bit, and the isobars have moved apart a little, and they're not going to get uh, quite that same speed. So that's where uh, that's where everybody is now, or now being um, four hours ago. Remember, we have a four-hour delay on these trackers, uh, but. Um, uh, I think it's quite a quite a race, quite exciting, classic conditions. Uh, really happy for everybody out there and uh, hope they're enjoying themselves. So uh, with that, I'll close today's show and hope to see you tomorrow uh, for the Trans-Pacific Yacht Club. I'm Dobbs Davis.